Good evening and uh, welcome everyone. Not necessarily evening, wherever you are. It's amazing to see people tuning in from all over the world uh, for this Lighthouse launch of the things I have withheld with Kai Miller. Um, I'm Myri from the Lighthouse Bookshop um, and it was going to be my immense pleasure to welcome uh, the tremendous Raman Mandare, uh, fellow poet, uh, who was going to be our host for this evening. But unfortunately, technology has not been kind to us. And uh, we thought since we have our main act uh, with us tonight, <clears throat> the award-winning poet and writer um, and now essayist extraordinaire, Kai Miller, we would just get the ball rolling um, and start things out. If you have questions for Kai, um, then pop them in the ask question box at the bottom <clears throat> of the screen. Um, and Raman is also going to be passing me some questions um, uh, and then I will channel her as much as I am able. Uh, but for now, from home, will you join me in a very warm welcome, raise your glasses, clap your hands uh, for the tremendous Kai Miller. Hi, Kai. Hi, thanks for having me. Uh, where are you actually tuning in from right now? I <clears throat> I am tuning in from Exeter right now. Okay, and soon yeah. to be in new places. Soon to be in new places, but so I was What's saying that the flat the flat is a, a mess of packing around me, and I've I've engineered this this weird corner that looks like nothing is happening, uh, but it's, <laughs> it's it's a lie. Well, thank you for creating this little piece of calm in the chaos just for us and yeah, for taking time out of the move uh, to, to be with us tonight. Um, as I was saying before, um, I found, I loved your book, um, cover to cover, um, and I, um, I found it deeply moving and I found oh, it, so um, uh, I loved the echoes of the poetry in it. Um, and uh, I am utterly unprepared for how sort of starstruck um, I am to be asking you about this incredible book. So I'm, while I collect my thoughts, I will ask you <laughs> just to get us started by telling us um, why these essays um, as a poet, why, why this form and why now? <clears throat> yeah, wow. That... That question as a poet, I'm not, I'm not sure if those lines exist as clearly in my head as they, as they might in other people's mind. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I, this is my second collection of essays. I've written three novels. I've written a collection of short yeah. stories. Yeah. Uh, so the question is always, what, what do I want to say now, and what form mm -hmm. does it take? But, but I don't. Certainly, in my mind. I, I I only go with I'm I'm a writer. I write. Mm -hmm. uh, right. I think a friend kind of once said that the those divisions that happen, they they tend to happen in America and and, and the U.S. Right? Well, when you meet world writers, that those those divisions feel more like a luxury. And, right. And, and, world writers, people who would classify themselves in that weird category of world writers or international mm -hmm. writers. They move much more nimbly across genres. I, 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 I don't know if it's something about trying to form new literatures in new places and just having to do or feeling the need to do lots of things or try your hand at lots of things. That it's just it's such a luxury to just sit in one genre. Um, yep. So uh, yeah. So, so so that's the first part. That it's that I don't see it as a poet coming to right. the essay. Right. It just feels like this was the project. Right. And and I guess I was, that quote from Dion Brand uh, that starts it, that I talk about a lot, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. that has been echoing in my mind for years, right? Right. Uh, and so at the beginning, the, the, the book was called The Most Important Things, which is, which is the other part of what she says. So, so, so this quote that I'm talking about, guys, is, mm -hmm. Uh, Dion Brand, uh, Canadian Trinidadian poet, essayist, novelist, just brilliant all around mind and thinker. She's giving a talk and she begins by saying, I, I should actually just read it so I don't misquote her. So she says at the beginning 
of one of her talks. Something that I thought was pretty daring. She says, some part of this text we are about to make is already written. For that I am a black woman speaking to a largely white audience is a major construction of the text. Blackness and whiteness structure and mediate our interchanges, verbal, physical, sensual, political. They mediate them so that there are some things that I will say to you and some mm -hmm. things that I want. And quite possibly the most important things will be the ones that I withhold. Mm -hmm. I just started to, I guess I recognize that in so many points in my life when it felt that here was an occasion where something, something very obvious happened and something important had to be said, mm -hmm. but it couldn't be said in that moment. Right. And the essay felt like a form in which I could return to all of these moments and offer words mm -hmm. because in that moment there was only silence and there's there there's always only ever silence at, at those moments whether mm -hmm. because it's the authority or it's or it's the police or you know whatever mm -hmm. it is or because you're trying to spare someone's feelings mm -hmm. whatever it is we we are often so silent especially people of color mm -hmm. And yeah, the essay felt like uh, a chance to return to them and to to offer words as carefully as I could. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, that, I think that's, it, that's what's really important. There seemed, there was a tenderness in the essay taking the shape of, of letters, especially, you know, um, when you speak directly to James Baldwin and it feels as a reader that you are, um, picking up on a correspondence uh, that you get to look in on, that you get to say things to him that you wouldn't say to anyone else. Um, and I wonder, you know, <clears throat> the collection and the essays all take these different shapes and forms, some story-like, um, you know, mm -hmm. in some places you, you don't um, name the objects of the essay um uh or the or the people the players they're they're not named but they're so incredibly recognizable um but they suddenly become universal uh the white woman on a stage or um you know the brown man in a neighborhood um yeah did did you know and and were the essays individually done and therefore done in that way or was the collection conceived of with these essays as such Wow, uh, a combination. Mm -hmm. uh, the essays certainly, in a sense, were written individually, but they were edited together to make a whole. Right. Uh, and some of the essays definitely came, like the last essay obviously came at the end. It could only have come at the end yeah. Yeah. Um, of, of everything. And But even starting with those letters to James Baldwin, they're... they're I guess that, that that's the kind of that's the writer in me that you're trying to, though it's one essay by itself, mm -hmm. you want echoes to come yeah. to be seeded throughout the whole book. Yeah. And yeah. and so even just that moment of just the smallness of that address, James, <clears throat> sorry, James, this is what happened. Mm -hmm. That I could do that in an essay five essays down, yeah. just stop and say. This is what happened. It's pulling you back into the. Yeah. Well, I hope it's pulling you back into the intimacy of the letters that started. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so yeah, a, a kind of combination. The other thing is that they were about. Are there fourteen essays in the book now? There were yeah, I think probably. So. There are probably twenty-five essays written in all. Okay. And so there's a lot that's with that is withheld from this collection. <laughs> about withholding <clears throat> and it was it was just about writing a lot and thinking no I, I don't think i want that there uh yeah just finding out what fit together yeah. in this one yeah. conversation that i wanted to have uh, the letters are interesting like, from, so i was going to say were they withheld from your publisher as in they never left you to go to the <clears> next <throat> person or withheld from oh, the no. final product 
a combination, probably five were withheld from the publisher and then probably another five were okay. withheld from, from the, the final thing. Uh, but those letters to James Baldwin and the letters to Binyavanga and the letters to James Baldwin again at the end, I guess it was a weird strategy. I, I was talking about this the other day that I think I think sometimes it's easier to overhear something than to have it said directly to you. Mm-hmm. That if you if you overhear it, you don't feel you don't feel as accused. You don't feel the need to put up your defenses right. because you can listen to someone talking intimately to someone else, right. and mm-hmm. you are you aren't in the line of fire in any way, and so mm-hmm. you, you can relax and you can listen. And I thought that that was a strategy that I wanted, that I wanted from early, that I, you, you know, I, it didn't feel like a book where, you know, especially when you talk about things like race, people can feel so defensive, but they can feel so accused. Mm-hmm. And I, I just, I didn't want that kind of tone, right. but I wanted to speak as honestly as I could. So I, I figured how, how do I let you put down your defenses to just listen? Right. Uh, to something that implicates all of us, to something that is not necessarily accusing you, but it's trying, it's trying its damnedest to work out the intricacies mm-hmm. of what's happening in these moments. Right. Okay. Who did you yeah. imagine as your reader, or hope for as your reader? Oh wow! I. That is a hard question. I mean, that you know that that question always comes up. Uh, and why was it so hard for this book that I, I it's 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 because the you know in those moments like writing to James Baldwin or writing to Binyavanga, the audience really is my imagination of James Baldwin right. okay. and my imagination of yeah you know, because I can't say that it it is them I have, yeah. I have certainly never met Baldwin. Uh, but I had to create a presence of someone who looked like me, would understand my experiences, was sympathetic, but was deeply, deeply intelligent and had deep wells of empathy mm-hmm. just for humanity. Mm-hmm. Uh, and again, if you overhear that conversation, it's fine, but I had to imagine mm-hmm an audience of someone who is sympathetic and wise and knowledgeable. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, there's something really, they're so tangible and real um, that even as you write about not knowing James and writing to a James that is the James of your memory and your reading and that that you are, he's totally present and he's, clearly the version to which you would have written these, these right. essays and these words. And then you kind of feel him listening through the whole book. Um, yeah, Ralan yeah. has dipped in to ask, uh, to put some questions for it. Um, so um, I'm just going to ask the first one, which was in your intro um, to the things I have withheld, you quote Dion Brand, so he mentioned, and I know she has been a beacon for you and an inspiration. I read that quote as about forging space and who we are with ourselves and with our people of color, with other cutie pops or with other queer people of color and with white people. Um, and I was wondering if you could speak about this shifting, this code switching, both in lived in experience and in creativity. Okay. <clears throat> Was about forging. I'm trying to understand the the question completely. Uh, I, I guess my my small interpretation of it that yes, it is about forging space. Uh, in that, uh, how would I put it? I, I think one of the things that became apparent to me writing writing this book or just thinking about it was uh, 
just how very there are really small experiences that I could tell to someone, uh, mm -hmm. and it would surprise them. And and you you wonder why does it surprise you? Like I, I know this happens to women all the time, right? You mm -hmm. like um, men just don't understand things that are really small and obvious mm -hmm. to every woman. Mm -hmm. It's because we experience the world via our bodies, um, mm -hmm. or our bodies make us understand or it, it makes us experience certain things that someone who doesn't live in that body simply does not experience and simply doesn't know. Um, right. Like a small thing, I, I'll tell you. Um, a, friend one, a friend in London once asked me to get a copy of his house key cut. And I said, I can't do that. I can't go into the store and get a copy of this key cut. Mm -hmm. And he, he's just like, why? Just go in and get it cut. It's like, I've done it all the time. So he didn't understand. So I just said, okay, fine, I'll, I'll do it. And of course I went in and I asked, can I get a copy of this key? And I was asked for all kinds of information about, is this my flat? Do I have papers? Do I, you know, he had never experienced that. He just thought it was such a simple thing, but I knew right. immediately that my body is not allowed the space mm -hmm. to do that. And you don't know that because you you live in this world in another body and, and it's fine, but you just don't know. Mm -hmm. How does that relate to the question? It's it's because I think though we seem to be living in the same space, we are not. Right. We experience profoundly different things. And, mm -hmm. and part of the idea about forging space is letting people in, is saying, right is slowly beginning to tell tell people this is my experience when mm -hmm. when i go to a club i don't get let in immediately i mm -hmm. can't go and get a key cut um this the, the rule that says you can't bring a dog into the supermarket only applies to me right <laughs> you know yeah i mean all there are all kinds of other rules that you don't know yeah. exist in this world yeah. because those rules have never applied to you but they're always enforced on my body and right. if we're going to live in the same space, if we're going to forge a space together, then you need to listen to how my space differs from you. Mm -hmm. And I, I mean, I think that's a bit of what Dion Brand was saying, even though I am, I'm not sure, I'm not sure Roman, if I think that Dion, Dion was being as hopeful. Um, you know, I'm, I'm not sure she was saying this is about forging space. I think for her it was, it was just recognizing how profoundly different those spaces can be. Um, and it takes so much effort, which is the effort I wanted to take in this book to begin to talk about those things. But I, I do not grudge anyone who does not take that effort because it mm -hmm. takes effort and it's sometimes painful and you can be dismissed. And sometimes that effort simply isn't worth it. And so some people don't try to forge those spaces. They they live with the knowledge that they that there are important things that divide us. And I can't be bothered to explain it to you because again, because it's painful and in the end you are going to dismiss it. Right. Right. And which is what this this book wanted to risk. It wanted to risk that dismissal. That can I say it carefully mm -hmm. enough? that you might begin to hear those complexities. Mm -hmm. I think um, it's one of the most bodily, physical, I mean, the book has a presence that you are, you inhabit the page physically as a black man through the whole book and, and as a gay man. And that was one of the things that had struck me when I first read it, which had made me think of Raman as a poet to interview you in the first place is that way that she has also spoken of existing in the world and how the world has you know interacts with you where it meets you at your um you know in in your body the body that goes oh, out into the world absolutely and, and it it runs through but you seem and you write with um a very conscious awareness not just of your own body, but in 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 empathizing with other bodies and other women. So, with the assault that happens under the the by the motorway in night uh, was it Nigeria? 
Uh, no, that was that was in Kenya. That was in Nairobi. Yes, um, and you're on your way to a bar, and it happened. But you, even in the in the writing and in reflecting on that moment, or reflecting on how incredibly vulnerable you were as an outsider, but already who you were, you know, not as a woman or not as someone who might have been smaller or less able-bodied. Yeah. Um, and I wonder if that's something that you inhabit and exist every day in in the way that you look at the world or was this something that when you went to the page became something you wanted to explore oh wow that's that's a good question uh i hope it's the way that i exist in this world mm -hmm. um and probably that that is part of being of writing fiction, of trying to inhabit as thoughtfully as possible someone else's body and thinking about what that body means in the world. Uh, I am so cautious of saying that I do understand. Right. Because a part of it is that I, I don't. Like I right. I try desperately hard to, mm -hmm. but I don't. Like, I mean, so and I think this is what makes the world continually surprising to me it's uh, it's talking to someone to anyone else who lives another kind of life and being stunned all over again by what i missed uh what i didn't understand and i mean i think that makes i mean if you live your life like mine it is very tiring to spend so much time thinking about what how did you view that how did you how is that true for you i mean it it, it's particularly frustrating when I want to be angry with someone mm -hmm. and on a level I understand it. Uh -huh. Like I understand what where they're coming from. I also understand how they perceive me. I think they're wrong about what I'm doing, but I can't go back in to explain where their misconception comes from. But but you just spend so much time thinking this. But but yeah, I, I but also uh you know that 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 essay at the very early on when I'm talking about that moment when my sister says, "I can't, I can't go on this walk. I can't walk from here to the neighbor's house." Right. And me, you know, teenage boy says, "But why? It's just, it's just five minutes. You you, you take up your foot and you fucking walk. What's the problem?" And and you know she says in that moment, "You can't understand this. You're a man." And again, as a phrase as small as that has echoed in my life for years. What is it about my body that makes me unable to understand that? Like, how dare she? And I don't think I understood it immediately. I think it took me at least a decade before mm -hmm. I could go back to that moment and go, oh my God, that's what she meant, or that's what I think she meant, or that's mm -hmm. the beginning mm -hmm. of what she meant. Um, but also, but knowledge is so bodily that I, I can begin to empathize, but I can never fully understand, can I, you know? And yeah, so I guess that's yeah. the point of the book, to look for these moments where my empathy makes me begin to understand, mm -hmm. uh, but I don't think that knowledge is ever complete or full. Right. You are incredibly um, patient and forgiving uh, in, in <laughs> many places to people who uh you know especially when it comes to uh to to the racism of white women um that that appears throughout the book in places of this making space for um them as complete people and and their racism being a component of the way they see the world we see the world as i speak as a white woman um and and you you portray them as complete people um that, oh, they don't that think, you are not all of them think happen. i do what's that what? i said not all of them think i do but <laughs> <laughs> well i just um the 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 uh the essay uh and and forgive me because i'm i'm without having prepared questions you weren't meant to do this i mean as everyone knows <laughs> and you're doing brilliantly i mean thank you by the way for <laughs> well, I'll, I'll come. Raman's got some wonderful questions, and I will get to them. But the I, I was speaking to a friend today who about these literary spaces and and how struck I was by your essay and watching a white woman on stage 
um, in in front of an audience um, having uh, a very casual racist throwaway comment and the collective <laughs> moment that you capture of that intake of breath both physical and inside of yeah. is is the chair going to say something or are they not do we want them to say something do we not yeah um, and i wonder if you can talk a little bit about existing in these spaces and working in these spaces in these literary spaces where um, often there is that thing of, of women being often portrayed as the more vulnerable or the more delicate or the more understanding or compassionate to um, to men and especially black men. Does that make sense? Yeah, I'm just uh, like, what does it what does it mean? Huh. Hmm. I'm not sure what that means, uh, the, um, <laughs> but it's, but that is something that I did want to unpack in this, in right. this, in this yeah. book. Um, and, and I say not everyone thinks that I've been compassionate. I mean, even though that this is one thing I, I do think I've, I've tried very hard to be, but the first essay on, on this book that came out as, as you might know, was really controversial and yeah. you know just coming back to the UK and and reading thinking of the the Guardian and reading this article that says you know incendiary essay by Kai Miller sparks tension across the Caribbean <laughs> and I thought just holy Christ yeah and I remember yeah. reading that essay over and over again and thinking I I thought I was being so compassionate I thought I was being mm -hmm. so gentle but yet, the, what happened is exactly what I wanted to unpack, and it's right. I, I, again, it's 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 a phrase I've been using a lot. Um, it's that again, our bodies give us access to different things, mm -hmm. and the body of the white woman gives her access to what I'd call a damsel privilege, right. and she can access that in a way that n no mm -hmm. other body can quite like her body. Black women can't do it in the same way. Certainly not black men. Um, you know, the, the, the white woman is the damsel. Yeah. And if she's uncomfortable, we have all learned to respond to her discomfort, mm -hmm. to respond to her crying, to you know, we mm -hmm. have to comfort her, which mm -hmm. is what happened in that essay. You know, a, a white woman felt uncomfortable mm -hmm. and she started to cry. And the whole world, the whole world is taught, how do we respond to the tears of a white woman? We defend yeah. her, we run to her yeah. comfort, we say they're there. Yeah. And yeah. I think it's only probably in the last two years because of other moments that have forced us to look at it in another way. Um, barbecue Becky happened. Right. Or that, right. that moment in Central Park happened. Mm -hmm. And we saw how the tears of the white woman were being weaponized mm -hmm. and they, they were brought on and they could bring, they could cause damage to another body. And you thought, mm -hmm. my God, there is those, and it can, I'm not saying this is always the case, but those tears, mm -hmm. and, and at the moment that the woman is crying, she, re, she does, she absolutely believes in those tears. Mm -hmm. But those tears come from a position of I am disempowered, but and yet they are so powerful mm -hmm. and so damaging. And I wanted to begin to just can we begin to mm -hmm. talk about that? Yeah. You know, how can we talk about that? Again, how can we talk about that carefully? Yeah. Uh, just to talk about its possibility, how it yeah. sometimes mm -hmm. happens. Yeah. And if because you know the world is taught us, you know, the it's always the man. We have to we have to attack the the, the white man that, mm -hmm. that 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 person that embodies power and i guess i, I just wanted to talk about other ways that power works mm -hmm. um and you know and you know especially in that is it to talk about my power as well what does mm -hmm. like what does it mean when these two figures who are both one step away from ultimate power there's mm -hmm. the white woman who can access white privilege but not male privilege and there's the black man who can access 
male privilege but not white privilege. Mm -hmm. And they are both using their powers, sometimes not consciously, but they are both using their powers against Mm -hmm. each other. Can we stop to think about the dynamics of what's happening? Mm -hmm. Um, That's kind of what I wanted to do. I found it fascinating. I didn't really answer your question, but sorry. No, no, I think I think you did. Um, I, I think one of the one of the aspects that struck me um, in in the book was that there have been more conversations, especially over the last few years, around yeah, white I've... feminism and around white fragility, and specifically about why women's tears. And but one of the things that really struck me in the book is the space you created to explore the silence and the self-censoring or the choosing to withhold in anticipation of the potential of the white woman's response um you know the the knowing that she's going to whether it's your friend or whether it's you know the woman that that she is going to respond in a particular way and therefore that the conversation has to be careful even before you've opened your mouth or even before oh, you yeah. finish the thought. Yes, I've not encountered that. I think you explore that. In, in, I found it fascinating to read. Yeah, but and yeah, I, I think that's that's just how how we live. I mean, I, I, again, I, I always think back at you can't be surprised at that if you think about how a man might respond to an accusation of of him being a bully or him being a misogynist, yeah. Yeah. how the man immediately yeah. goes, I love women. I could never be a misogynist, blah, blah, blah. You mm-hmm. you must mm-hmm. anticipate it already. And you, cho- and you either choose to go there or not go there. You right. know, you, but but, but you, you are measuring it already because you know you know yeah. that a defense yeah. is going to come up and you have to work your way around that defense. It's just that black people have to do the same things. Yeah. You can't imagine yeah. black women have to do it so many times because they have to yeah. do it against blackness and and, and maleness. And, and yeah, so, I mean, that's the thing that, that I think though, though some of these experiences are particular to me as a black man, mm-hmm. I think a lot of us can relate to it. Mm-hmm. All of our experiences of the world are so particular. Mm-hmm. And there are so many times when we choose silences rather than explain things that we perceive because of the particularities of our bodies. Mm-hmm. And I actually think that's a universal experience. Mm-hmm. I think you you have a real gift for putting the words to that, that space, that gap in the silence um, in, in so many places through the book. I'm going to... Um, just Raman has got a question here uh, in, oh, in yeah. the comments, okay. um, and I wonder: uh, Do you want me to read it out, or is it easier for sure. you to read it? Um, so Raman's written: um, I love the communing with James B. It reads on multiple levels, including a black queer love letter, tender, intimate, open, vulnerable, but also part of remembering and claiming black intellectual thought and creativity. You mentioned Morrison, Langston et al. The collection is a sense of longing, a yearning, a thirst for more knowledge, more reflections of an intellectual black man, more reflections of a black gay man. There is hunger I sense between the lines. Like the collection is a way of joining that tribe of majesty. Is your collection a connecting medium or through line between the past and present black queer intellectual thought. Oh my God, I love that question. Um, mm-hmm. Just because I, I've never thought of it like that, Roman. Um, but certainly, but certainly it would be. I mean, if and and if you add to that list the the person who the book is clearly in homage to, Dion Brand, who mm-hmm. <sighs> easy. Dion Brand is a kind of writer who, one, I don't know why she is not more known. I mean, she's huge in Canada, but why she's not more known here is is a wonder to me. Why she hasn't won the Nobel Prize yet is a wonder to me. How anyone has things with that kind of majesty of thought and just makes it so 
delicate and beautiful, but it is, it, I am stunned by, by her thinking, by her ability to think. Mm -hmm. And I'm certainly mm -hmm. trying to join that community of, you know, and, you know, again, Dion Brown is another woman of color, queer, immigrant, you know. And I also think that it's, I mean, you're right to bring up that that, that essay, Roman, Roman uh, an absence of poets and poodles, because one of the questions I want to ask, and I do ask silently um, in in that, because because this man is so surprised by, by me. Uh, and I, I would have to tell the audience what that surprise was. I mean, he's, he's just surprised by a reading that went well, but it, this is the kind of thing that happens a lot. Um, I, I, another example I gave um, recently on, on, on radio that a lot of you might, might have heard if you're in Scotland um, is this, this, this odd moment in New Zealand years ago where I, I, I give an interview on stage and the next day I'm walking in the streets of Wellington and a man comes up to me, an old man who, you know, he seemed, he seemed wonderful in his own way and, and he's really enthusiastic. He came up to me and he said, oh my God, you're Kai Miller. And I said, yes, I'm Kai Miller. And he said, oh, I was, I was in your session yesterday. It was so wonderful. It was brilliant, blah, blah, blah. And he was being very effusive. It was great. Uh, but, you know, I, I thought, wow, that, that's like a little too effusive for me. I, I didn't know how to respond graciously enough to it. And he said, and it was so wonderful seeing the shocking disparity between your eloquence and your physical appearance. And you see, the, the thing is that he genuinely meant this, right? I mean, as cringeworthy as it is, and that's what I want to do, you want to go, oh my God. In that moment, I, there's a, a perfect moment of the only thing I can do is be silent. I cannot respond to the words one ought to respond with because I have to be very careful. I'd have to acknowledge that I do understand that he meant to compliment me, but... Right. And we didn't have time. We didn't have we didn't have enough of a relationship to go yeah. through that. Uh, but again, here's a moment where black intellect is a surprise. Right. Raman's written, like they, Raman's written like they take our breath away with their velvet punches. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so. So yeah, I mean, certainly I, I wanted to explore that and connect. You're absolutely right, Roman. I wanted to connect to that community where black intellect, black scholarship, mm -hmm. black beauty of thought is not a surprising thing. Mm -hmm. it, is, it is not a peculiar outcome of the black experience. Mm -hmm. uh, and again, because I have been so enriched by that community that that continually humbles me just by the, the grace and the elegance mm -hmm. and the, you know, the, the absolute depth of, of their thought. Mm -hmm. I think, God, I, I yeah, <clears throat> the book does want to connect, absolutely. I, I, I hadn't thought about it like that before, but that's precisely right. Mm -hmm. um, there's another question from Raman. Um, an absence, re an absence of poets and poodles and the gentile white English host. Um, hello. Um, it struck me as a portrait of one of those arguably likable idiots that the English like to watch, like John Cleese in Faulty Towers or Boris Johnson. Um, <laughs> but underneath the veneer is a dangerous lack, a void where he can't imagine homegrown black Jamaican intellectuals or poodles for that matter. I like how you leave a space in the essay, almost a resting space for an innocent mouth that's fallen open in incredulity. How much is your use of space and white space on the page, a space for thought, breath, etc., informed by your poetry practice? Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm sure they are they are informing each other, but I I don't know if I have an incredibly deep answer for that. No? Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, I certainly don't think. Uh, again, kind of a, as I was saying in the beginning, I don't think of 
experimentation as belonging to my poetry persona. Uh, okay. You know, it, it, it's again that question of approaching the essay as a poet. Mm -hmm. And the truth is I probably approach the essay I mean, my poetry is definitely informing a lot of what I write. Mm -hmm. But in the essay, I, and I, I mean, I am giving all kinds of disclaimers before. And I do think that poem, my poetry and my essays come from a similar place. Mm -hmm. And yet in the writing of it, it is myself as fiction writer that I am more conscious of that is bearing its weight. And it's it's because I want to tell you a story. Again, part of part of how I will work my way around your defenses is just to say, no, 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 not not lecturing you. I'm not I'm not accusing you of anything. Mm -hmm. Just telling you a story. So the other day, this is what happened. Right. Uh, so. So yeah, those experiments happen. You know, the the, the use of the use of space in that essay, um, the use of space in, in at the very the very beginning poem that opens it, mm -hmm. uh, and it could be coming from my place as my identity as a poet, and yet I don't think so. I, I think my identity as a writer across genres is always thinking of how should this look on the page. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I, I think that's, that is as tr true for how I write fiction as it is for poetry. Mm -hmm. um, I, I just think word placement matters and, and the yeah. space between words matters and how it rests on the page. These things, mm -hmm. these things matter. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, it, it matters for all genres. Mm -hmm. I'm glad Raman asked that because having um, read the book and then listened to the audiobook and listened to the essays. I, I was struck by that interplay of, 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 of that slightly different experience on the page um, that left a space for the reader. It left a space for me to experience the words on the page that was clearly a an active decision that you had made as the writer. Whereas with the audiobook, um, it was your voice and you were clearly reading it exactly as you intended to say it because you knew how it was supposed to be heard. And they were quite, um, you know, complementary, but quite, quite different experiences. I was glad I, was glad I had both, but I found that interesting. Right. And, and I'm, I'm glad she asked about that because it's, it's also be very beautiful as, as an object, the book to, to look at and to see the way you, the words sit together. Oh, I, I love that. I mean, which is, which is of course Canon Gate, right? I mean, that's that's just having brilliant publishers. But seeing the book physically was so exhilarating because I just mm -hmm. thought I wanted it to be a physically beautiful book. I wanted it to be mm -hmm. beautifully typeset. Mm -hmm. And but that's that's a that's a kind of point where you don't have that much control. And when right. when you see it and you thought oh my God, you get it. You get what it's supposed to be and you, you've done it. I was, oh, it, thank you, Canon Gate. Yeah, yeah, to everyone watching, like it, it really, it really is inside and out. Like the screen won't do it justice, but it, it's just, it's just so, oh, I've got too much light. So beautiful. Um, this no, might be um it, sorry no i just said they gave it space they gave it the space yes. yeah um there's another great question from raman i was just wondering um given we were talking about that space um i wonder if you would give us a little reading kai if you were up for it yeah do you uh you did ask me this a little bit before um and gave you no time at all to think about it. All right. I mean, I, yeah. I'll, I'll just I, I'll just randomly read the first thing that my amazing <coughs> every page. page Excellent. Uh, <clears throat> 
All right, yeah, this is the beginning of the essay, The Boys at the Harbor. In Kingston at night, the harbor is beautiful, almost as beautiful as the boys who gather around it. The boys who are still young and still have dreams as big and bright as the fireworks that light up the waterfront each new year. On that night, the first day of the year, the waterfront does not belong to the boys, but to a new throng of people who wouldn't normally venture into this part of town. People who have learned a long time ago how not to see these boys. And maybe even tonight, though it isn't the new year, if you pass by the harbor, you will not see them either, sitting as they do in the shadows, under the sweet almond trees, these boys talking about their big and bright dreams. It hurts a little to hear them speak about these dreams, to hear them speak about a future I sometimes doubt will be theirs. We're going to live in one of them big, big house on the hilltop, the boy says, looking behind, not to the water, but to the hills that rise over this brutal city. I follow his gaze and look to those lights glittering like sequins on the hills, the hills to which the New Year's crowd will, will return. The house that I grew up in is on those hills as well, and I too will return there in just a couple of hours. My father's house is, is emitting one of those lights. I'm going to, sorry, I'm not going to work for nobody neither, the boy continues. I'm going to be my own boss, just a little money for start my business, that's all I need. He says none of this as if it is a question, as if the future is in any doubt. He says it as a simple fact something that will happen in the near future. When I start my own business, you will see where it take me. And he looks again to the hills. I try to smile, but I worry that my smile might not be convincing or that the boys might think it patronizing. I wonder when it was that I stopped believing in the world as they do. It strikes me as selfish, my lack of faith. If anyone should have lost faith, it is these boys who have been kicked out of their houses, who have slept in gullies or in bus sheds or right here at the harbor. I wonder how it is that they have kept their faith, but maybe faith is all the more important when you have so little else. There is a sound strange and terrifying, like the strangled voice I imagine death might speak with. Cling, cling. Saville says, pointing, and we all look towards the harbor, to the thing he's pointing at, and I only barely see the shape of a bird sailing across the water, a bird that is the same color as the night, so is quickly lost inside it. Soon there is only its sound. I think about the bird, about its feathers that just became one with the water. I think of the water as a large feathered thing, a giant crow sulking in the night. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I think it's, thank you. Um, that you can open the book on any page um, and read and for the reading to be quite so beautiful is remarkable. Um, here is Raman's uh, question. And then there's another one from the audience already. And if anyone watching has any questions and you're watching on Crowdcast, feel free to pop in a question and I will, um, uh, I will read it for you. Um, so Raman's question is, I salute and celebrate your querying of styles, voices, and form in the book. For example, Mr. Brown, Mrs. White, and Miss Black reads his allegory near fable-esque. Tell me about your intent when it comes to queering the gaze and specifically uh, a kitty pop gaze. Oh, I, I don't know if that's conscious, Roman, that, that I would think of it in those terms. I mean, I, I'm, I'm sure I do, uh, but I mean, I'm just querying that because, because you're asking about intention. And I'm not sure it it comes in my mind as intention um, to do that. Like, 
I, I think for this book, there are so many other kinds of voices um, and other kinds of experience and other kinds of bodies that I wanted to include. And that is, you're right, that, that is queering it in a, in a way. Uh, I just wonder why, why my, why, why is it that in my mind I naturally is just probably because it, in my mind it seems so natural um, that I would involve these other kinds of experiences and these other kinds of ways and these, and also imagine these other kinds of audiences. Uh, like, like if we're talking about the gays, G A Z E, you're talking about, I mean, who. Who do you imagine as the reader, the ideal reader? Who, whose, whose gaze is informing how you write and how you speak? And so often, you know, for, for so many writers of color, I mean, for, for so long that that has been the white gaze. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, you you can't use Creole too much. You can't use this too much, or whatever. You, you have to accommodate someone who might think it's too far and too out there. Uh, for me, I interpret the idea of queering the gaze as just in imagining someone like myself as the ideal reader. Mm -hmm. But that seems so natural now, like it doesn't even seem revolutionary to me again. It, and the reason I would do that isn't even political anymore. It has to do with craft. If if I try to write to an audience who, if my major imagination of an audience is someone who is too too separate from me, then I begin to explain too much. Mm -hmm. And what suffers is the writing, the, the quality of the music of the writing begins to suffer because I'm accommodating too much. And so, so to decenter that gaze is not a political decision for me, it is a craft decision. Mm -hmm. that if I want to write my best, I need a queer gaze to, uh, to inform. I need, a, I need a colored gaze to begin to inform the work. And I need to write mm -hmm. to that. And, and that has everything to do with wanting to be the best writer I can be. Mm -hmm. And there, there are sideline political reasons why it's beneficial as well. But the reasons why I do it really have to do with craft more than politics. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Raman has added um, Creole Patois Indo-English is broken English, as if it were supposed to be fixed, that it doesn't have value in itself. Yeah, I mean, and with, you know, which, oh, sorry, uh, someone's trying to call me. Uh, <laughs> yes, we have to go a little bit, having started a little bit late. Yeah, um, but... Uh, yeah, I mean, the, that has been said so often and oftentimes repeated, you know, in Caribbean literature circles. Um, but my education has been so thoroughly kind of post-colonial, you know, having gone to UA in Jamaica, that j just these ideas like, like, we know that's bullshit. <laughs> you know, we know that this idea of Creole as an inferior language is, is crap. Like, we, we know that. So, you know, I always feel that, yeah, we've, we've settled that, we've moved on. I mean, in the same way that lots of Scottish writers have, have mm -hmm. you know, said mm -hmm. that it's like, obviously, you know, writing in Scots is valid. Obviously, mm -hmm. you know, like, like, why would we argue that anymore? It's, 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 it's just a given. Um, there's a question from the audience um, from, I'm going to try it, from Faria. It's a beautiful name. Um, do you think we can ever teach each other then? Doesn't the key to peace in relations lie in understanding each other? Yes, I think so. Uh, but but I, I wonder what, what the, probably, probably I'd have to go back to where that was connected to. But but yes, yeah, I, I would agree. Um, but in that in that sense, I think I guess I'm so much so much more interested in these these days in how how we listen to each other. Mm -hmm. 
if that makes any sense. I'm like, I am so conscious of the burden that women might have to explain themselves to men, that people of color might have to explain themselves to white people. You know, to the, the burden of it all. Uh, and so it's not, so not only are we misunderstood, but it's our burden, our duty to make the effort to explain ourselves. Mm -hmm. Again, I, just, I, I don't, I don't grudge anyone who doesn't want to take that effort. Mm -hmm. um, but, I, but I do think that, you know, certainly me as a man, it's my duty to listen. It's not, it's not, it's not, it's not the woman's duty to, to, to pacify me and take the time and explain until I understand. It's my job to listen. Mm -hmm. uh, hopefully this, this book creates a space where I can say certain things and if you want to listen, you can listen, but mm -hmm. it's still not my duty. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not beating myself up for you to or, or tailoring it in a, in, in a perfect way that it becomes acceptable to you. I, I mean, mm -hmm. I want to, I do want to write something to make it as beautiful and as thoughtful as possible and as mm -hmm. fair as possible. Uh, but not in a way that it's my duty, you know, to make make someone who doesn't understand, to make them understand. Mm -hmm. uh, Raman says, is it our job? What about the labor of that for us, by us and going for you? Um, yeah, I think one of the one of the aspects of the book that struck me and I think it's interesting you say about the listening is that it it the active listening and the curiosity that you have for the seeing of the things that might not be immediately evident is such an invitation to the reader to find the beauty and the challenge in participating in that in listening for yourself and seeking out that you know those opportunities to to observe and listen and just be without being in it or doing um it's a lovely quality to the book, I thought. Yeah. Um, do we have um, any more burning audience questions? Um, feel free to put them in the chat if you have them. Uh, thank you all for coming, by the way, and listening. It's lovely. Yes, thank you. And thank you for um, bearing with me as I channel uh, Raman, who, who would have been um, if it was eloquent, elegant, pertinent, and interesting, it was Raman. Um, for everything else, blame me. Um, can I ask then, <laughs> um, if people are just being shy, um, can I ask a, a final question about the reception of the book? Okay. Um, and it's just come out um, here in the UK. Is it out in the US yet? Is it, no, is it it's coming, coming out? out in the US in September. Okay, okay. Yeah. So I wanted, I wanted to ask about, you know, how, how is it putting this book out in the world just now and whether or not you anticipate a, a different reception in the UK to, to the US? Oh, yeah, well, I don't know what the reception in the US is going to be. Um, the re Reception in the UK has has been so incredibly warm, um, so far. Uh, yeah, I, I don't know if I quite anticipated that, but it's still early days, and I guess part of me is nervous. But but it's nervous in that way because if this doesn't sound too egotistical, the there's sometimes you write a book and you are actually damn proud of it. Huh? Mm -hmm. And I am, I am so proud of this book, but also it is the most personal book that I've written. And yeah. so that that's, that's for one is that I think I wrote my ass off for this, but also <laughs> this is me. Uh, and if you don't like it, you don't like me. <laughs> like this is this is absolutely who I am. And yeah, so so we'll see how people react to it if they if they write reviews or you know. But it's it, it's it's been warm and wonderful so far. 
Uh, mm -hmm. But it's still early days, so I'm still nervous. Yeah. There's audience question, uh, audience comments saying, we love you and we love the book, Kai, from Nadine. Oh, thank you, Mary Nadine. Williams saying, you should be, you should be proud. Um, uh, and, and here we go, can't wait to meet you on paper, Kai. Um, yeah. Uh, thank you for the incredible act of generosity that this book is to, to put so much of yourself on the page, um, the vulnerability that is evident on the page, the power that it was, it's an extraordinary and, and beautiful book. Um, oh, I love, love, love the book, Kai, thank you. Um, I think anyone oh, thank you, who, you cannot pick up this book and not be changed and moved and transported. It's extraordinary. Um, thank you for joining us tonight. Uh, thanks for bearing with the technical glitches. Hey. Me, I'm sorry. Uh, my my I, I, my teacher from high school just said hi. Oh, that's so nice. See, tech can be a total bitch sometimes, but then we get this. We get to have you on screen and people all over the world, and not necessarily right here in Edinburgh, who could get to the shop on West Nicholson Street, being able to um, dial in and take part. Um, so, thank you. For everyone, I'm going to call it a night unless you had any uh, last words, Kai. No, no, just just thank you. Thank you for having me and thank you for thank you for buying, thank you for reading, thank you for engaging with my work so far. So yeah. thank you. I'm looking I haven't read the novels yet. So I am very excited to have more of your storytelling. Um, <laughs> Um, uh, also, although you have not seen her on the screen, as I say, um, anything yeah. intelligent spoken from me was from Raman, um, who is in her own right, um, an extraordinary, um, poet and writer and, um, filmmaker and activist. And I entreat you all to find, uh, go out and find her poetry and her work as well. Um, she is epically cool and, uh, she had to do this from the comments. Um, so thank you, Kai, for rolling with it. Um, thank you, Raman, uh, for sharing your questions and keeping us on track. Thank you, everyone, for watching. And I'm going to say good night. Good night. And...